Pressure sensitivity, a type of measurement we use in medical equipment, meteorology, carnival games. It wasn't long before someone said, yeah, let's put that in a video game, one you've probably heard of. One of the first games to make use of something like this was the original Street Fighter in arcades. The cabinet had these big pads on it, one for punch, one for kick, and depending how hard you hit the pad, that would execute that strength of attack. The control style actually being inspired by those test your strength carnival games. It wasn't long before these machines started to fail as they were being punched by children and adults all day and cap Capcom would go on to ship the infinitely more successful Street Fighter 2 with the six button control layout we still use today. But that was arcades, you know, you could Frankenstein your own controller just for your game. I mean, it would be expensive, but the sky really was the limit. One of the first home console controllers to include these kinds of buttons was a third party PS1 controller by Namco called the Nejicon, which is a terrible name, but I really wish I had one of these back in the day. This controller released less than a month after the PS1 came out in Japan which likely explains why we have this unfamiliar face button naming scheme. Instead of X and square, you have the Roman numeral one and two buttons. And if you look at the shell of the controller, you can kind of see how they're in a valley of their own, allowing you to see more of the spine of the button. This allows for more travel time and conveys that they're analog pressure sensitive. Same thing goes for the controller's left trigger, but oddly enough, not the right. The right trigger and every other button on the controller was a digital input. So what do I mean by that? Digital versus analog. Digital buttons or switches can only ever be in one of two different states, on or off. There's no gray area, no middle ground, no in between while analog devices transfer information in the form of a range. Think of this like your smartphone's screen brightness or volume slider. So with a controller, one button can contain multiple functions based on the pressure of the input. The range of pressure values depends purely on the hardware. The Nejicon, for example, can sense 32 levels of pressure. Obviously, it's going to be really difficult for a human to hit one specific level of pressure, but having a range like this is really beneficial to games that the Nejicon supports, such as driving games where the face buttons act as gas and brake pedals. If you think about the real-life juxtaposition, it makes sense why we have a gas pedal and not a gas button. When you're getting in your car for a trip to your local Quick Trip or a Wawa, hopefully you don't smash the gas pedal immediately after ignition. All you need is a kiss from the big toe, and a digital button can't achieve that like an analog mechanism can. We can also apply this concept into steering. Yes, I've been completely ignoring the Nejicon's main feature, mostly because it doesn't have to do with the topic of this video, pressure sensitivity, but it's a really good example of analog control. Before the days of analog sticks in the DualShock 1, your only means of steering with the original PlayStation controller was with the D-pad. If you haven't noticed by now, the Nejicon is actually two pieces cut in half vertically, connected by a swivel. This allows for those clean, smooth turns, as opposed to those jittery ones you get by chicken pecking on the D-pad. Only around 50 PS1 games and a small handful of PS2 games actually support the Nejicon. Unsurprisingly, a lot of them being from Namco themselves. You've got games like Gran Turismo, Ridge Racer, Crash Team Racing, and even the Ace Combat series. All in all, a really cool little controller. I'm sad I missed out on it. Maybe I'll snag one in the future off eBay for the price of like 50 McChickens. It wasn't until the PlayStation 2 that a console manufacturer would make the decision to design their first party controller, the DualShock 2, with pressure sensitive buttons. All of them, except for Start, Select, L3, and R3. And that useless analog mode button. Back at the turn of the millennia, the PS2 was looking to be a monumental improvement over the PS1. And to kind of paint that picture and put that into perspective, there were rumors that Saddam Hussein, please don't flag this video, was stockpiling thousands of PlayStation 2s with the intention of chaining them together to create a supercomputer and utilize it for a missile guidance system. This turned out to be false. But it goes to show the public perception of computers at the time, and the perceived power of Sony's new console. Sony's way of letting consumers know this was through these strange ads, 
and by adding a new piece of functionality to the controller without fixing what isn't already broken. Really a strategy that they've been using ever since. While the DualShock 2 was a definite improvement in build quality over the DualShock 1, like having higher quality analog sticks and decreasing the overall weight, pressure sensitivity was its only brand new, standout, marketable feature. It's just, unfortunately, the phrase pressure sensitive buttons doesn't compare to Sony's future commercial buzzwords like 6-axis, touchpad, or adaptive triggers. The truth is, a lot of legwork had already been done in between 1994's PlayStation controller to the DualShock 2 in 2000 in the form of the short-lived dual analog controller with its concave analog sticks and the aforementioned DualShock with its dual vibration motors. What I'm getting at is it's possible that the DualShock 2's pressure sensitivity feature exists due to demands from Sony's marketing division rather than being a meaningful idea from an engineer. But if that's the case, why is it so understated on the DualShock 2 box? On the side, we do see a label for analog control, which is more so highlighting the analog sticks, but technically does encompass the pressure sensitive or analog buttons as well. We can confirm this on the back of the box where it says when that analog mode button is on, the following have analog capability, and it goes on to list the sticks, obviously, and all the buttons that we talked about earlier. While technically true, this is a little misleading, as software has the ability to control what mode the controller is in. So for PS2 games, you really don't need to worry about the button at all. The game will switch you between the two, and 99% of the time you'll be in analog mode. This analog button existed on the Dual Analog, the DualShock 1, and DualShock 2. Unlike the DualShocks, the Dual Analog had an additional analog mode where the LED would turn green. This mode was implemented to emulate flight controls more accurately in games like Ace Combat. And this controller was immune from having its analog switch disabled or enabled by software, making it 100% manual. So for example, a PS1 game like Ape Escape, which not only supports analog mode, but it forces the controller to stay in analog mode. If I had a PS1 dual analog controller, I could bypass this and the game wouldn't be playable. The game would just read it as if you had a normal, non-analog stick PlayStation 1 controller plugged in. So getting off that tangent, it's clear that there was a lot of work done on the PlayStation 1 controller throughout the PS1's lifespan. It could definitely be argued that not every PlayStation owner would have those upgraded controllers, so for a good chunk of PS1 consumers, the DualShock 2 would be a significant upgrade. So with the history and the analog stuff out of the way, let's look at some PS2 games that actually supported pressure-sensitive buttons. First off, if you have a stash of PS2 games and you want to see which are pressure sensitive, the easiest way to tell is just by looking on the back. Unless you bought it from Blockbuster because all of my Blockbuster games have this giant sticker on it. Um, Jack and Daxter is not pressure sensitive. I had to look it up. We already talked about how the Nejicon supported a bunch of driving games and as you would expect, the PS2 is no different. Despite the fact that the DualShock 2 doesn't have the long face buttons that the Nejicon controller does, it can sense 256 levels of pressure on all its pressure sensitive buttons. I'm gonna be honest, during my testing of Gran Turismo 3, I could maybe differentiate my press strength between like three levels, so 256 seems like a bit of an overkill. And this is likely because I've always been terrible at Gran Turismo and similar racing games. But holding the button to obtain max speed starts to hurt after a bit, and I realize you're supposed to let off of it during turns, but as you can see in the footage, I still play these kinds of games like I would a Mario Kart or Crash Team Racing game. I had a good time driving in the GTA games with this feature. It's not a monumental difference in speed or brake power, as I can see a lot of people playing through the entire game and not knowing about the feature. Some developers implemented pressure sensitivity into their melee combat like Silent Hill 2 and 3 and The Bouncer. All of these games operate around the same logic, where if you press one of the melee attack buttons hard, your character will execute a heavy attack that has a different animation. This is less important in the Silent Hill games where you only have one melee attack button, and more so in The Bouncer where you have several. How the gunplay works in Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3 is something I could never wrap my mind around as a child. 
And wouldn't you know it, the answer lies in pressure sensitivity. How this works is you hold square to pull out the gun, doesn't matter how hard or soft. What matters is how softly or abruptly you remove your finger from square. If you slowly remove it, Snake just puts his gun away. If you quickly remove it, that's when he'll shoot. This was done in case you find yourself in a situation where you just want to hold somebody at gunpoint but not actually shoot them. Just for fun, I actually had a third-party PS2 controller laying around, and doing some research, most of these do not have analog buttons, so I wanted to see what would happen in Metal Gear Solid 2 if I used it. And after doing some testing, it looks like it always defaults to the hard button release. I also used one of those Brooks converters for DualShock 2s to try out an Xbox One controller, and same result. All hard presses. So just something to keep in mind if you plan on going back to these games and you don't have an original DualShock 2. Moving on from Metal Gear, some other games that incorporate pressure sensitivity include Okami, where you can control the brush stroke width, several MLB The Show games where you can achieve harder pitches or swings, Zone of the Enders where you can tighten the spray of your spray fire weapons, PsyOps, the Mindgate Conspiracy, the pressure you put on the L1 button determines how high you lift crates with your psycho powers, and God of War 1 and 2, but I have no idea where it's implemented. The back of the case says it's supported, and you know, I've beaten these games three times a piece or more. I went ahead and booted them up, tested a bunch of stuff that I thought pressure sensitivity might have a hand in, like kicking crates, quick time events, opening doors and chests, combat on Pegasus, combat with the Sword of Olympus, combat with the blades, I mean, I couldn't find anything. I looked online a few times as well, no luck. So if anyone has any information on where pressure sensitivity is implemented in the original two God of Wars, I would love to know. So far we've talked about games that are mildly dependent on pressure sensitivity and games that just sprinkle it in. I was able to find a game that I had never played, never heard of, that completely depends on it. The game in question being a rhythm game that released in early 2002 in North America called Mad Maestro. It's a game that's easy enough to understand. You fill the role of a composer whose job it is to save their town's concert hall from being demolished by recruiting a model, a reporter, some aliens, a guy in a lion costume, who reminds me of that really disturbing part with the dog costume in The Shining, to perform in your orchestra and convince the town the concert hall is worth saving. At face value, it's a fairly simple rhythm game. The objective is to press a face button of your choice in time with the rhythm, which is liable to change. Shown by the size of the diamond or triangle, in the middle. Sometimes the game will ask you to accompany your button presses with holding a specific direction on the d-pad. The catch is that each beat has one of three pre-assigned pressures they must be pressed at. You can see the six level gauge on the right side of the screen to see how hard you are currently pressing. Blue for light, green for medium, and red for hard. This had me intrigued for two reasons. One, because I had never played any rhythm game like it. And two, it would be a really good way to test how accurate the PS2 face buttons were at measuring pressure. And what did I think after the two hours it took me to beat the main story? I mean, it's alright, like... In a lot of ways, it's certainly flawed. Unfortunately, mostly due to the pressure controls. To the game's credit, the three levels of pressure feel correct. You really gotta smash a face button to get a hard press, light press is just a kiss, and medium is in between. So from like a technical level, the game is perfectly fine. I don't blame it for my failings. But when the game asks you to alternate between those three and quick succession? It feels like playing red light green light while patting your head and rubbing your stomach. After a sequence of like hard press, light press, hard press, normal press, hard press, my thumb is just so confused. The hard presses are just really draining because you can't just lay your thumb on the controller and press a little bit harder than normal. You have to like raise your thumb up and swat it down and use that momentum to get the hard press. And that would be fine if it was over the course of 10 seconds like a song on the ocarina in Zelda, but this is over the course of a whole song. For the most part, it seems like the devs were aware of the whiplash effect you get from switching between hard, light, and normal so often. The fact you usually transition to other levels of pressure through multiple beats instead of every beat, to me is evidence of that. But even with that design choice in mind, Mad Maestro doesn't give me what I truly crave in a rhythm game, and that is a good sense of flow. Even when I started to get competent at the game, it still didn't feel good to hit the button in rhythm like how it would in Guitar Hero. In games like Guitar Hero and DDR, 
it feels good to finally wire your brain to play a certain song. In Mad Maestro, I'm much less worried about what the upcoming beats look like, more so my execution of them. After a minute or so of mashing, it gets really hard to tell the difference between a normal press and a hard press. It's very hard to quickly adjust the force you're putting on one button versus just switching to another button. It gives you that same disoriented feeling in other rhythm games when you have more inputs coming at you than you can register, except instead of evaluating where your fingers need to be at that time, you're doing a really dexterous task again and again. So apart from this game being the pressure sensitivity test tube baby, what else is there to say about it? If you're really into classical music, you'll probably get a kick out of the song selection. The graphics really evoke that early PS2 low-budget vibe. They're stylized just enough to not look terrible, but all of the character model animation has this really uncanny puppet movement. There's not a lot of squash and stretch, and everybody looks like they're made of Play-Doh. Limbs move independently of one another, and I just gotta say, I am shocked that this woman is able to stand normally, on account of the size of her bosoms. Maybe that's why she only plays the cello. So as you've probably guessed, pressure sensitivity in the sixth generation of gaming wasn't exactly what Sony had envisioned it to be. And it wasn't what Microsoft had envisioned either. Likely following in Sony's footsteps, the Xbox's Duke and Model S controllers both had pressure-sensitive buttons. Every one of them except for the D-pad, start, back, and pressing in the sticks. As far as I can tell, there wasn't as many games that supported it, nor did Microsoft really call attention to it all that much. They didn't even list it as a feature on the back of the box. I'm pretty skippy that Fable didn't have it, but Morrowind did. And yeah, look, they don't even mark up the other box. I gotta say, I love the design of these feature boxes. They followed the same design language as the Xbox menus. If you were wondering what exactly pressure-sensitive buttons do in Morrowind, you could determine how high your character would jump, and you could raise or lower the price of an offer to a vendor more quickly by pressing in the black or white button with more force. A bunch of ported games from the PS2 also had it on Xbox, like Metal Gear Solid 2, GTA, which we already talked about. One of the few exclusives I found was Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball, yet another game that really objectifies women. I don't think there's any relation to pressure sensitivity in that. It just speaks to how the early 2000s were, unfortunately. Rated M for Mature. Hey! <laughs> play with a friend or play with yourself. Oh, be. Yes, that was a real commercial. You can determine the size of jumps and how hard you spike the volleyball. For those of you unaware, this is actually a spin-off game from a fighting game series that also used pressure-sensitive buttons. Make up your mind. Wrestling is the baddest! Get ready, fight! Microsoft would drop pressure sensitivity in their controllers with the release of the Xbox 360 in 2005. Sony would actually maintain it in the release of the PlayStation 3 with both of their controllers, the 6-axis and the later release DualShock 3. Being that the feature was equally unpopular between players and developers throughout the PlayStation 2 lifespan, I couldn't find anything from Sony explaining why they decided to carry it forward onto the PS3. We must take risks to reap the rewards. But I'd be willing to bet it had to do with Sony's business strategy around the PS3 of sparing absolutely no expense. We have added powerful and elegant system. You can say a lot of things about the original PS3 launch, but Sony was making sure that consumers were getting their 599 US dollars worth. I mean, it didn't work, but it's still incredible what this box can do. As far as the PS3 game lineup that supported it, there's notably a lot less, and almost all of them are franchises which had games on the PS2 that use this feature. And we're not about cutting corners to rush a product to market. Sony has confirmed that hackers broke into its PlayStation network, exposing the personal information of up to 77 million users worldwide. With the unveiling of the PlayStation 4 and DualShock 4, Sony finally dropped pressure-sensitive buttons. DualShock 4 controllers can connect to PS3 consoles, wired and wirelessly, but as you would expect, PS3 games that incorporated pressure-sensitive buttons wouldn't gel with the digital input of the DualShock 4. And that brings us to our fairly standard controller layout we have today. Apart from analog sticks, touchpads, and the triggers, 
everything on the Xbox Series controller and the PS5 DualSense controller is a digital input. That's not to say that pressure sensitive features haven't popped up on other gaming platforms like the Nintendo DS touchscreen, a feature that iPhones used to have called 3D Touch starting with the iPhone 6S and ending with the iPhone XS, or as some say, iPhone XS, Match point. and more recently the touchpad clicks on the Steam Deck. I'm sure there is more obscure hardware out there that incorporates pressure sensitivity, but at this point in the timeline we're far past the small golden age this feature had. It's time to look back and reflect. Why was pressure sensitivity unsuccessful in the first place? And is it possible we'll ever see it again? To answer the first question, the obvious answer is, not enough games used it. It was really only relatively popular for that string of PS2 driving games. The pressure sensitive acceleration feature was definitely interesting on paper, but not very comfortable in execution. Racing games like Gran Turismo 4 released later in the PS2's lifespan started giving players the option to use the right stick to accelerate instead of using the pressure sensitive X button, a feature that still sees use today in Gran Turismo 7. Racing games on the Xbox like the original Forza Motorsport didn't seem to have this acceleration identity crisis? Likely because it was mapped to the original Xbox controller's analog triggers, which had a long travel time and really were just more comfortable. Shout out to the Dreamcast, which also had analog triggers. What about games that wanted to map more functions to the face buttons like The Bouncer or Dead or Alive 3? Isn't it plausible you wouldn't want your game limited by the number of buttons on the controller? While that's a fair point, there's a lot more dexterity that goes into pressing a button a certain way versus just pressing two buttons, which when faced with this problem, 90% of developers just tack on holding a bumper or a trigger in addition to the face button. As Triple Dun Patchy puts it, mistaken inputs are worse than not enough inputs. Plus, it was difficult to give the player feedback from the pressure they're inputting, visually or tactilely. Vibration motors weren't as precise as the haptics we see in controllers and smartphones today. So will we ever see them again? Well, that more so depends on external factors outside of the console manufacturers. What I mean is that if a killer app arises that depends on pressure-sensitive buttons, it's not impossible. The caveat being there's not an obvious use case for them right now that hasn't already been taken by analog triggers. Not to mention, people are a lot more comfortable nowadays using the bumpers and triggers. Back then, there was definitely some anxiety that went with being asked to press buttons you couldn't see. As much as I'd love to be proven wrong, no, I don't think we'll see these again on a mainline console's OEM controller. The legitimate use cases we have are far too slim and mostly edge cases. Although, if I had to give one example from my testing that I really liked that's effect couldn't be imitated with a trigger or button combination, it would be the melee combat in Silent Hill 2 and 3. This is for the same reason a lot of survival horror games implement tank controls, or just control a little bit more clunky than an action game. In Silent Hill 2, you're not playing as Kratos or the Master Chief, you're playing as James Sunderland. So while I expect 20 foot jumps and flawless melee attacks from Master Chief, it might take James a little more work to come close to that, and that's why I don't have a problem with his heavy melee attack taking a little bit of extra effort. So even if myself and several others enjoy this feature, it's not what makes Silent Hill 2 great, nor is it something that a controller should be designed around. Hey there, this is Shane Mania. Just wanted to say thank you so much for making it to the end of the video. It's been a long time since I've gotten back into this YouTube business. Um, started back in 2007 on an old channel and you had all kinds of, you know, like MySpace features back then. You could change the background of your channel and comment on other people's channels. So all this Discord and whatnot is new to me. But um, I have opened a Discord. It's, I haven't done much with it. I really need to clean it up, but I want it to uh, be a place for, um, to discuss research, future videos on my channel, uh, maybe video essay tips, things of that nature. So, you know, a work in progress, but we're moving right along. So feel free to press all the buttons. Please tip your servers and have a great rest of your night. And I'll see you next time.